the story. As Jerry said, uh, I'm an avid fly fisherman. Just so you know, you know, you have you've seen the, some of you may have seen the movie The Bucket List. So on my bucket list, I just have one thing, and that is I want to have fish in every country where trout live. And that's my goal. I'm about halfway there. And I, um, so we'll see if I ever reach it. So fly fishing mainly for, for trout, but I'll cast a fly wherever a, a fish will take it. As I learned just a month ago, I actually caught a shark on the fly. And uh, they told me that doesn't happen, but it did. Uh, so that was a, a surprise. Anyway, I go out to Yellowstone, and I'll give you the background why do I go. I've been going every other year since 1975. It's because a friend of mine that I used to teach with um, gave up teaching and got in his car and drove out to Yellowstone, got a job, got a job. And uh, he became a head stonemason for Yellowstone Park. And then we all said, well, let's go bother him. And so my friends go out there. There's now just two of us that go. So the three of us go out. And we, because he works for the park, he can get the back uh, country ranching cabins after the Labor Day. So we always go with him in September. And then we just pack up our gear. We don't have to take tents. We don't have to take sleeping bags, cooking pots, all that stuff. That makes it great. And then we just take our fishing gear and hike in and hit the ranger cabins. And we travel for about uh, six days. We usually do two to three ranger cabins over about a 30 mile uh, area. And we fish the backcountry. And it's just been a wonderful experience. I wouldn't give it up for anything. So, long story, uh, as an introduction, um, the, there was a problem that I learned about several years ago about lake trout. In Yellowstone Lake, and that, I think I'll do this right, that's Yellowstone Lake, and there's other lakes in the area. And this one, so you know, we'll come back and talk about all of them. Uh, this is Hart Lake, uh, this is Lewis Lake, this is Shoshone. So you know, right here, basically along this line, is the Continental Divide, all right? One watershed versus another. This is the gigantic Yellowstone Lake, and Yellowstone Lake has some uh, terms that people use private. And this is the palm. This is, these are the two arms. I don't know why they didn't get called fingers. But there's two arms, and there's the thumb. Okay? There's actually a small village there called West Thumb. Right? So those are the areas that you see. And over here, there's another little town. And it's, not, it's a park service town. It's not where people live uh, otherwise. And that's called Lake. All right? So that's it. But there's nothing else around here. Okay? It's a small few park service things. So this is Yellowstone Lake. And in 1994, um, I believe, was the date that will show up on all my slides, a fisherman fishing in this lake caught a fish he couldn't identify. Prior to that, the main fish that was in there was cutthroat trout. And it was a phenomenal fishery. Caught a fish he didn't know about. Brought it in to be checked, but it was a lake trout. And this set off alarm bells throughout the park, because lake trout were not indigenous to Yellowstone Lake. So now, which one do I push to move ahead? Go on the computer, Jen. Oh, I have to go to the computer? Yeah. All right. All right, so that's the beginning. And I always have to show you my uh, friends, um, because they're very important to me. And, and this is Red. He's the guy who works for the park. This is where he lives in Yellowstone. That's his dog who goes everywhere with him. Um, and that's my friend Tim who goes out there with me. And so this is, this is the group that heads into the back country to go fishing. And um, poor Tim was also stuck with the lake trout trip I did. And you'll see why I say stuck in a minute. But anyway, the lake trout, for those of you who have fished them to, to go after, it's a wonderful game fish. Right here in Upper Saranac Lake, there's beautiful lake trout to catch. Uh, you can catch huge ones. Um, and so it's a good fishery. But when it's in an area that it shouldn't be, as in Yellowstone, it's turned into a devastating invasive. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. It's not good. OK, there's what uh, the two look like. They look like the same size and not. The lake trout is much bigger, usually. Um, but the lake trout um, is here. Cutthroat here. They're easy to tell apart by their markings across the cut is famous for the cut under the operculum of the gill, the red slash. And you, you can spot them anywhere when you see them. So that's what they look like. You can see there's other distinguishing 
such as square tail versus fork tail and the reticular pattern on their sides. The um, uh, cutthroat trout, and there's one, I have to show you all the ones I caught. So um, there's a, a cutthroat. Now look at the size of that. that. That's caught, and I'll show you the stream I caught it in. The fishery in Yellowstone, for those who've been there, is just phenomenal. But the lake trout is a char, meaning it's salvalinus, is its genus. It lives in 45, it's preferred, 45, 55. You see the size that it gets normally, although the record is 70 pounds. Now right, here's the difference that's important. They spawn in the fall on shoals. They're not a fluvial spawner. They don't go into the rivers to spawn. They spawn on shoals. The cutthroat tr trout is part of this Pacific salmon group. You know, they're not salmo by their, um, their, their classification. There are Ancorincus, the uh, Clark Eye, and there's an enormous number of subspecies of cuts and rainbows in this area. They live in the 40 to 65 degrees. They're a little more temperature tolerant. They're smaller, and they spawn in the spring in the streams. And they, and they are very predictable, just like salmon return, return, returning to their home uh, streams. Now, the cutthroat trout, there's a distinct group, the Yellowstone uh, cutthroat trout, and this was their historic range, and now they're down to their current range. And why has they lost their historic range? Because of what was once good ideas, they thought, in fisheries management, introduction of other trout. And other trout that they've introduced about competed the cutthroat trout and reduced its range. The biggest problem they face is with the brown trout, the very uh, quickly outcompetes them, but also the brook trout outcompetes the cut as well. So they've uh, been introduced artificially into this area and have reduced the historic range of the cutthroat trout. But right here is Yellowstone Park, and you see in the, this is Montana and Wyoming, and you notice how large Yellowstone Lake is when you consider the size of the entire park. Uh, the old story, you can see it from space. Now we get a better look of Yellowstone. And someone asked me when I came in, is it in Wyoming? Yes, you know, it's 90% in Wyoming, with a small part here in Montana and along the western border, but basically entirely within um, the state of Wyoming. Now, so you know, th this shows you the, um, basically the drainage divides. Remember I talked to you about the continental divide being right here. So these three lakes separated from here. This is the lake itself with the names I told you, the arms and the thumb. You've got um, the Yellowstone <coughs> River that flows out and then the famous Slough Creek, Soda Butte Creeks, which you'll see in almost every fly fish in the magazine at least once a year because of the attraction that it has for fishing and the different entrances. There's <coughs> the western entrance here and then the northern entrance here and that's how people get into the park. So that gives you an example of where you are in the area, okay? So, what's the story? Well, remember I told you that in 1994, someone found or caught a lake trout. What has been the repercussions of that? This is an angler reported catch in Yellowstone Lake. You know, anglers are given a card and they buy their license and then they fill it out. But it's volunteer, you know, the accuracy you could question, you know, you know, the old story of all fishermen are liars, except you and I, but I'm not so sure about you. But you can't really trust the fisherman when he talks about his catch or the size. But anyway, over the years, the, the data is pretty reproducible, so you, you just have a line factor built into it. But what you see here is from, you know, 78 through till 90, the, um, the cutthroat trout length was pretty stable. The catch was pretty stable. Then we started to see uh, a length increase, right? And then notice in 94, a few people were catching lake trout, not, a ma not many, but they were catching them. And then notice this catastrophic decline, starting in the mid-90s. And notice also the interesting response on the <coughs> trout length. Maybe we can talk about that later, but it's basically a consequence of the predation of the lake trout on the cutthroats. So clearly, there was a problem the uh, cutthroats were disappearing from Yellowstone, and the um, lake trout were um, probably responsible for it. Now you notice that this indicates, gee, there must not be many lake trout. But anybody who fishes for them knows one thing. 
You only can catch them at certain times of the year when the surface waters, temperatures they like. Because then they dive deep. They love to be deep. Cutthroats like to be on the surface. They try to go deep. So you don't catch them except during the spawning time or the early spring and ice out. In between, you got to troll for them if you're a fly fisherman. Yeah, on, on Yellowstone Lake, it's predominantly a fly fishing uh, fishery, so people weren't catching any. Um, so there was no indication there was an enormous population of lake trout here. But there was a real problem because of um, this decline in the catch rate, which made fishermen very unhappy, and they were complaining, what's going on? Well, I'll give you some other data that the fisheries group started to collect and consider. Again, this is Yellowstone Lake with its uh, component parts. And this map shows you where the uh, fisheries analysis goes. There's netting sites, and there's also uh, areas where they have fish counted. But when the cuts go up the street, and I'm going to show you one of them specifically, and this is Clear Creek over here. All right? This is where they have a fish count for the number of cuts that will go up the river. There's also another one over here, Bridge Creek, all right? And then, then here are the netting sites. There's also a fish counter here over at the uh, Sewer Creek, and there's one in Solution Creek as well. These two together have counters on them. But I'll just talk about these two in, in a second. All right, so the Park Service started looking at what's the data that's telling us about this uh, complaint from fishermen to not catching any more cuts. Well, here's the data mapped from Clear Creek, okay? Now, there's some very interesting data here because it speaks to several things. First, notice the data that starts in, in uh, the mid-1940s. It's pretty low. Remember, this is times 10 to the third. So we're talking about 10,000 <coughs> cuts coming up this creek every sporting season. That's 10,000. You might think it's a lot. But what happened in 1958-59, uh, they did two things. They changed the catch uh, limitations, catch limits on Yellowstone Lake, <coughs> dramatically reduced the number you could take and put slot lakes in. You could only take fish between 15 and 22 inches. If they're under 15, you couldn't. In juvenile, if they're over 22, they were the real breeders, and you had to return them. That was, and the other thing they did there used to be a uh, egg harvesting um, production facility on Yellowstone Lake. They take the fertile uh, females and the males. They would strip them, fertilize the eggs, and send the eggs all around the country. So the, the fish weren't producing in their own lake. And there were millions and millions of eggs shipped every year from Yellowstone Lake to other areas for planting, for growth and planting. So they stopped the stripping and the fertilization egg production, and they changed the uh, harvest rules, and then look what happened at the migrating fish up this creek. Now, I started going out there in 1975, okay? And look at that, we're up to 55,000 peak, one time 70, but across this time frame, until 94, the uh, until 92 actually, the average number of fish that came up this creek was 43,000 every breeding season. But then, you'll see here, all of a sudden, it started to decline rapidly. Just crashed. They weren't coming back. And a little rebound here, and then they just went back down. Here in 2006, 496 cuts came up this creek. Remember, we were talking about 43,000 just a little while ago. They were down to 496. That other creek I showed you, Bridge Creek, went to zero in 96. None came back when they were also up in that high level of return. So this was clearly an indication that the fishery was collapsing. Also in those netting sites, you can see they were doing OK, and then it started to decline. The, the cutthroat trout was disappearing. The breeding cutthroat trout was disappearing from <coughs> Yellowstone. And this is me on Clear Creek in 1975. And there were so many trout in Clear Creek in 1975, I'm not fishing. There's no fishing pole there. I'm just leaning over and grabbing as they swim by. You can just put your hand in and scoop them up. 
that you could almost walk on them. The old story they said when they came to America, you know, the first pioneers, they, the trout was so thick you could walk across their backs. You could. There was just nothing but trout in this stretch of this creek. Now, as you can see, that's called a creek out there. It's basically a very strong stream close to a river. But yeah, that's how thick they were in 1975. You could grab them in your hands. Okay, summary. Fish management practices in the late 50s created a phenomenal cutthroat fishery in Yellowstone Lake. I'll end up with a picture showing you how it was back then. Lake trout discovered in 94, there was an explosive growth in the lake trout population. I haven't shown you that yet, but that data will come forward. And then there was a spectacular de decline in the cut population and a serious decline in fishing success. So what are we going to do about it? By the way, remember that fish I showed you in the background that was the cut in that one? Yeah, that fish was caught right under that overhang, and that's less than 10 inches of water, that size of fish. So just so you how great a place it is to go with three if you want to fish, all right? Anyway, there was a panel put together in 95. 94, they discovered what they thought they knew. Bad news. So they put a panel together of, of nationally recognized fishery scientists, and they came up with 16 possible methods, and after fighting over for a couple of days, the Park Service decided to take two of those. One was gill netting, and the other was electroshocking the sporting beds. In other words, when the trout came up to the shoals, they set the grids out and just zap them to try and kill them so they didn't breathe, and then set up gill nets just to catch them. Okay? So those were the two plans. Well, I knew about this. It had been going on now since 1997, and had reached the point of a very, very high production system. So I asked my friend Red, the guy I showed you, can you get me on a day to go out and do this? I'm at a college where we study invasive species. I'd love to learn about it. So he did. He was able to get me uh, arranged to go out on the uh, boat to uh, see what was going on out on the lake. And that's the boat. This is a specially designed, it actually was built just for this project. It's the gill netting boat. And when you go to the lake to get on the boat, you have to drive two hours to get there, because no one can live any closer than that if you're not working in the park So you, the boat leaves at 7 in the morning, so I have to get up at 4, drive for two hours. We get there, and I'm all loaded with my camera and everything. I'm going to get on this boat and watch everybody busting their butts working. And I go up and I say, well, thanks for letting me go to observe. And he said, you're not observing. He said, man, two people call in sick. you got to work the nets. Well, I'd never worked with Gil Nett in my life, so it was a funny, uh, he didn't think it was funny, it was a funny day. But um, anyway, we boarded this uh, uh, boat here at 7 a.m. and we took off. And where we were taking off to was a gill netting site. This is a lake again, the arms and the thumb. And over here are what they control, the control nets. These nets are deep water. And they're designed to catch the, the uh, lake trout that are just traveling at there very deep part. And over here is the um, shoal area, and they're catching the uh, lake trout that are coming up to sport. We were up there in September. That's when they're spawning. Late August to October is their sporting time. And you can see there's a lot more nets here in the thumb. Okay, so we're out after the sporting. So here's lake, so we motor across, and we start uh, the job right there. This is the boat when you get inside. This is Phil Depke. He's the wildlife biologist in charge of the lake trout program. He's also the captain of the boat. And he is Captain Ahab. You, you have to work, and boy, he shouts the orders and runs a tight ship. Has, has anybody been involved in the building operation at sea or anything like that? Well, I've never been. It is brutal. It's a production thing. You never stop from the moment you hit the nets. For eight hours, we did not stop pulling, cleaning, dumping. And, uh, I would never do it again. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's Phil, and he's uh, an outstanding scientist out there, uh, and he's done a lot of good work both with the lake trout, and I'll mention something at the end. There's my friend Tim, and it's not a quiet boat. You see he's wearing the air things. It's a diesel boat, and the noise was horrendous. 
So we got into the thumb. I'm going to show you this picture for just the reason. See, there's a car there, there's a car there. This is how close we are to shore when we're starting to haul the nets. And you can see the buoys right there and there. But I'm going to come back to this. It's, it's not only just to show you where we are, but again, it's a connection to the past for me. Because there used to be a campground here, and I was here at one point in the past. So we put it here, and that's where we're heading for, to start pulling the nets. And there's Brad. He's pulling the first net. He's grabbed the uh, buoy, and then starting to come in. Brad is an interesting guy. He was a high school graduate of last June. He was accepted into the environmental science program at um, San Diego State University, and he took the year off to work at Yellowstone before he started school. So this was part of his job, working the, um, the Lake Trout Invasives program. OK, so the, the nets come in. There's my friend Tim. This is Molly. She's a, a, a Yellowstone Park worker. She's been doing this for five years. This woman is unbelievable. How she can pull those nets, get those fish out, and get them back in. She left me and Tim in the dust. She was unbelievable. This is Patrick. He's a retired policeman from Newport Beach, California. And he comes up and works this boat every year because he gets free out of it. And it's a great deal. He loves it. So anyway, the nets are coming in, all right, as Brad is pulled in. And you can't see it right now, but what we're, and I'm hit this end, I have to handle the net coming down the tray to get it ready to go right back out again. You can't wait. You've got to get it ready. And what we're looking for in there, what they're pulling out are the trout that are in the gill nets. And there they are. You see? There's Molly's got a good size one, Tim's got one here, Patrick's got another. And they just, this net's coming over, and you're pulling trout as fast as you can to keep it going. And then, as the net moves down the tray, you got to, and now I, we've switched jobs. And I don't know if you can see, this net is just filled with trout. This net has to be put down into the catch basin and ready to be thrown out the back side. And now, it's, you're loading the net up, you got the buoys ready to go, and it's going out the back door again. Non-stop production, like I said, eight hours. And then you let it go out. Yeah, you let it go out. And while they're letting it go out, someone else goes to the trout that just came out of that net. And these are lake trout. And you notice the slit there. Every lake trout has to be slit with the storage they have left. Because what we're going to do at the end of the day is take all of the trout we took, drive out to the middle of the lake, and we dump them in the lake. You don't keep them. The reason for, I said, what's, what, what's going on here? This is good fish to eat. They said, no, we've got to keep the protein balance in the lake. We take it, all these trout out, and we're going to set up the ecosystem dependent on this uh, nutrient flow. So they dump them back into the lake. And look at that one right there. Yeah. So there's some amazing fish that we pull out. <coughs> then when we dump them, of course, the birds, the Pisciforous birds just love to follow this boat. And they come in and pick up before they sink what they can get. But I'm showing you this not because of that, because of these two white guys here, right there. White pelicans. They have a natural population of white pelicans in Yellowstone. And I'm going to show you that because, again, you, the, the world is so interconnected. I learned something brand new just a month ago. But anyway, here's the white pelicans, and they come in and diving after the fish we've thrown over. And this gives you a, uh, an idea of the size of Yellowstone Lake. OK, so what's happened here? Let's look at the top one here. The lake trout number. This is how they've been getting them by gill nets. OK? And remember here, they, they started after they had the meeting in 95, 96. And you notice they weren't very good. Then they got better, and they got better. This was basically scientific method. They've never done this before. No one had done this before. So they had to figure out where to put the nets, what was the mesh size. The first thing they did had the wrong mesh size, and they were catching as many cutthroat trout as they were lake trout. They wanted to do that, but that didn't solve it. So it took years to work out where to put the nets, what depth to put the nets, what's the mesh size, even the material that the net was made of so that uh, they would be more efficient at catching. And so over this time, they've become better and better at getting the lake trout out of here. All right? And 
The same thing happened down in here where they were looking at getting the spawn. This was the general uh, control nets. This is the spawning lake trout. And they look at the numbers they were getting now. This is 10 to the 3, right? So they're getting lots and lots of spawning uh, lake trout out. The good news was that the lake trout length was declining. The average lake trout in 1997 in Yellowstone was predicted to eat 41 cutthroat trout. An amazing uh, predation of the trout. And as you reduce the size, that number that they eat per year drops. Because they're not able to get as many of the bigger <coughs> cuts. So that was also a key component. Getting these sizes down as well as just getting them out of there. So anyway, what happened was that they were able to show that the, the gill netting program was being very, very effective at getting lake trout out of <coughs> Yellowstone Lake. So it, it's, it's a project that's uh, ongoing. They do it every year, and it's going to continue because the good news is that the uh, cubs of trout are now rebounding. Now to show you, again, but the lake trout is a great game fish. And at the end of the day, Captain Ahab allowed me to pull up my fly rod and cast twice. And it just so happened that's the one I got on the second cast. And those are the, the ones you can catch during the spawning time in, in the thumb. They're right on the surface, and you have a, a wonderful opportunity for uh, catching fish. So they, since they started the gill netting, approximately a half a million lake trout have been killed. Phenomenal number have been taken out in this way. But the cost up to 2009, because that's the data I have, is over a million dollars. That's a million dollars, that's your tax money. Because it is the national park that's paying for this. So someone, somehow, Lake Trout got dumped into this lake and it's cost the uh, American people just a million dollars. But here's the problem. As with most invasives, they'll never get rid of them. They'll never get to zero. It's going to go on forever. So the cost to us is never ending if we want to keep the cutthroat trout population in Yellowstone. Well, one of the questions that also came up, and I was very interested in because it was very good science, at the end of the day, okay, that's what we're faced with now, a continuing investment in harvesting lake trout so the cutthroat trout is not destroyed in Yellowstone Lake. Where did these lake trout come from? They've never been seen in Yellowstone Lake. They knew that. So how did they get into Yellowstone Lake? Well, if you look at the lake, you know, there's an outlet. And there are downstream lakes that also drain into the Yellowstone River that have lake trout in them. So someone would say, OK, well, you know, they swam up the river. Not that they don't like to be in rivers, but you know, so well, they could have got up there this way, all right? Well, there's one reason why that wouldn't happen, and that's because of Yellowstone Falls, a natural fish barrier, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. There it is, just a little bit down from the open outlet of Yellowstone Lake. And I don't think you'd see any fish swimming up that one. The other problem was, well, where else could they come from? Remember I mentioned, here's the Continental Divide. Here's Hart Lake, Lewis Lake, and Shoshone. Lewis Lake and Hart Lake, it turned out, have Lake trout in them. Lewis Lake got their trout in eight, their lake trout in 1890, and Hart Lake got their uh, lake trout in 1906, which was considered, you know, at that time the fisheries people said, oh, let's get some lake trout, we'll get more people to come fish for bigger fish. So there were, <coughs> there's been a <coughs> sustained population in both of these lakes. But, you know, the continental divide, the trout didn't climb up to the top of the continental divide and slide down with the Yellowstone on the other side. So how could they get there? Did they come from there? So some of the fisheries scientists decided, can we find out where they came from? Did they come from these lakes? So what they did <coughs> was they used the otolith that exists in the fish. That little valve talking. You have otoliths that allow you to understand where you are in you know, the um, accelerating world that we're in. 
keeps you balanced, it keeps you knowing you're moving forward, whether you're upside down, right side up. <coughs> and fish have these odorless that are in here, and they're made of calcium carbonate, just like yours. But the difference with a um, fish uh, odorless is it's like tree rings, and you can age the fish. Probably most of you know that. So here's a cross section of an odorless, and you can see the annular rings that are in there. So first of all, you can tell how old the fish is, right? And these are small. See, there's 100 microns right there. But the other thing is they're calcium carbonate. Okay, so they take up a divalent cation. But just like any um, bone calcium carbonate structure that's made biologically, they don't discriminate. The cells that make it don't discriminate between divalents. You've got another divalent in your bloodstream. You've got another divalent in the water that enters your bloodstream, you'll use it, and you'll put it into the odor. So what you do is you find out there's another nice divalent, strontium, that it will be taken up into the odor. And what you can get is a strontium-calcium ratio, and the way the fish puts it into the odor is exactly that correlated with the ratio that the two cations exist in the water that they live in. And this uh, diagram shows that, okay? So here's the strontium calcium ratio for uh, Lewis Lake, right? And there's the one for the fish from Lewis Lake. <coughs> there's the next one from uh, Hart Lake, and there's Yellowstone. So when you pull a fish from Yellowstone, you can find the ratio that match, matches what's the water, what the water is. You can find it for um, heart, and you can find it for Lewis. So it's a way of determining where that fish could have come from. All right. So then, when they had, they were able to do that. This is done by mass spectrometry. Then what they did was they went out and tried to catch fish that um, they could analyze, and they did do that. So here's a group of fish. Now, the, what this is, remember you can age them because you can look at the other. And then you can take a look at that, where that strontium calcium ratio is depending upon where that is, how old it is. And you notice here's fish one at this ratio, boom. Corresponding to 1989, because here we are at 97, 98, there was a change in the ratio. Here's another one. Boom, a change in the ratio corresponds to 1989. This is an interesting one. Came along, oops, it corresponds to 1996. And here are fish that are young enough uh, that they, they didn't go back to 89, and they're from Yellowstone Lake, showing that there's a very consistent uh, ratio in Yellowstone Lake. <coughs> Just jump around. All right? So what this showed was there was at least some evidence that the lake trout were dumped in around 1989. Now there's a plus or minus on that, so you know, within a couple of years. But that's what it, it, it indicates that some lake trout got put into the Yellowstone, or came to Yellowstone, in 1989, and that that calcium strontium ratio is identical to the uh, fish from the Lewis Lake prior to that 89 date. So it was a nice bit of really good science able to detect where these now invasive species have come from. They've come from Lewis Lake. How did they get there? Well, no one knows that. And one of the interesting things I don't, I don't understand at all, I just read uh, the most recent paper on it. You know, when you think about it, they took out a half a million so far. Well, how many were dumped in? You could start with one male and one female, right? Someone brought two over and dumped them in. But of course, the population uh, studies say you couldn't get that 400,000 with two. Well, maybe they brought four. Maybe they brought 10. Well, anyway, the scientists have looked at this. And the minimum number that needed to be dumped with, and they come up with an exact number, who knows if it's exact, is 296. It had to be dumped into Yellowstone to produce the explosion that they saw in the late 90s. So, to me, that's fascinating. It's, they didn't swim there. There were 296 eagles picking up a, a lake trout, flying over, and then losing control of them and having them flop into the lake. Um, 
Um, you know, the, someone obviously took a very, very serious effort to pick up small Lake Town Fry. They were small. And haul them over the Continental Divide and dump them into the old Stone Lake approximately in 1989. And that has led to this enormous effort and this enormous expense. So we know where they came from, we know when they came in, and we know we're stuck with them, and we're going to have to keep going after them. But there's also unintended consequences. And by the way, when we're hiking in the backcountry, see that's a nice grizzly paw print. And that was um, one of the ones I met the last time I was out there. And we changed direction right after we saw that and went a different way to get to the lake. But, you know, who would uh, trout fishermen would care about Yellowstone cuts versus lake trout. One's a great fish to catch, the other one's you can catch lots of right? So you want big ones a couple of times a year, or you want lots of small ones. You know, is it just the fisherman issue? Once you have the lake trout there, fine. You have a beautiful lake trout, catch them twice a year. Well, Yellowstone Lake, uh, Yellowstone Lake cutthroat trout was top predator in the lake. Fine. Now, of course, the lake trout is the top predator. But guess what? Where do they sit in the overall food chain in Yellowstone Park? 42 avian and mammalian species use cut as a food source. Some of them almost exclusively at certain times of the year, including breeding fall leaves. Now, why do they just go for lake trout? Well, because the cuts are on the surface, the lake trout are down when the eagles breed. Not as good chance to get food, right? So the other thing is, the grizzlies come out, middle of May, cuts start going up the stream in June. Great protein food sauce for the bear and her cubs. And it was well known up until the 90s that you could go find grizzlies feeding in places like Clear Creek and Bridge Creek because of the no enormous number of cuts they could feed from. Well, they are not doing that now, and actually the big problem is they're roaming further from their den sites and spreading into areas like a lake, like a west Tom, and creating problems and raising the issues of trans, you know, getting them knocked out and moving them out. They become a nuisance because their food sources disappear. Same thing with coyotes, by the way. I didn't realize this, but there was a, there's films. Coyotes go to the uh, cutthroat trout streams and actually catch. Uh, cuts. They grab them with their jaws. They, they, the Park Service has phenomenal pictures of these coyotes jumping from rock to rock, grabbing cutthroat trout. It's just a very interesting thing I never knew about. Well, here's another one. Remember I mentioned the white pelicans? They were feeding off the cuts that were behind my boat. Well, here's the white pelicans. This is not Yellowstone Park. One month ago, I was at the Ding Darling National Wildlife Preserve in Florida, on Sanibel Island. And I was fishing, I tried to do everywhere. And as the tide went out, a shoal appeared, and these birds landed, white pelicans. Now in Florida, the predominant pelicans are brown pelicans. And I thought, oh, wow, these are terrific. So I took a picture of them, and then I went and stopped to see the naturalist. I said, what about these white pelicans? He said, oh yeah, they come in every year. They come in from my Montana. Because we banned them, we know that. And then he, in our conversation, he just happened to say, and we're really concerned because there's been a decline in the population. Because the pelican is also feeding on those cuts, and there are not as many of them. And I don't know what the overall effect on the population is, but it was interesting to speak to that um, uh, naturalist who just said, yeah, we're worried about them, they're declining. And I said, well, maybe it's the lake trout in Yellowstone. And he didn't, hadn't heard about that. So it's the unintended consequences of this invasive species is actually seen on the shores of an island in Florida. All right, and the final picture is, remember I showed you that picture in uh, West Thumb where the two cars were, we were picking up the buoy? Well, that's me a long time ago, obviously. That's the cuts you could catch within half an hour of fishing. And I'm standing basically where those two cars were. And this is actually 1981. And so there's the thumb out there, and we were out there pulling the fish. But now, this is something that isn't going to be happening for a few more years in that area. The trout are not there. Okay. That's the end of the story, I believe.
Yes, it is. This is what we really need to know. All right. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Well, his not coming back. The the the, um, the netting uh, numbers have been stable for three years and have not declined, but they haven't grown, so they're stable. Um, and the return to Clear Creek has not started yet because they have to be breeding age, so there's probably a delay before they start to see that. Um, but yes, the, at least for three years now, the the netting sites have been um, constant in the netting they've been getting. Are they getting bigger? Uh, I don't know that. Um, uh, I don't know. That. Are the cutthroat trout coexisting across the continental divide in Hart Lake and Goose Lake? With the lake it's hardly, uh, actually, back in the 70s, before there was a road there, I, you would hike into Hart Lake. And you hiked into Hart Lake for lake trout fishing, you didn't catch cuts. Because the cuts were just almost not there. But the, and the lake trout have been there for nine, hundreds of years. But when, but when I when I hiked in there with my buddy back in the 70s, um, we went to go to the lake trout in the fall because we knew there was one. Any other uh, management approaches to reducing lake trout besides gill nets? Is there, like, like you said, you mentioned electro shopping and stuff like that. Is there any other? Well, there are people working on producing, um, you know, the um, infertile males, but that's a big project. It's extremely expensive. Um, they they had considered allowing commercial fishermen in to do that, but then some of the scientists raised the question about extraction of the protein from yeah. the food chain. And that was stopped. Um, I don't remember all the different things suggested. Right now, that's the two there they're doing. Yeah? Um, I know you're talking about limits a few years back, but do they have hatch limits now? And yes, they do. Yeah, I don't know what they are, but they're basically the same they've been for the last 40 years. There's a slot limit, and you can't take the, the small ones or the, or the or big ones. That's only in Yellowstone. The rest of the, the fluvial part is all catch and release. You can't keep anything. Unless, unless you catch a lake trout. By the way, in Yellowstone, it's, it's law. You catch a lake trout, you kill it. And if you're caught releasing a lake trout, you can be fined. <laughs> Same thing goes with brook trout. You have to kill them. You have to take them. Because they're an invasive too in the shootings. And they're causing a problem. So they want you to take the, the brook trout. Yeah. Are they having any plans for refuge lakes that are what shallow so you can have liquors and uh, just put their front throats in there and kind of give up on Yellowstone? Uh, I, I can't tell you that. I do know that two years ago, and I just discovered this on the boat talking to Phil, they actually uh, discovered two streams with heritage cutthroats that show no sign of hybridization. That's been the biggest problem, even in Yellowstone <coughs> Lake. There's some people, have, the brook did, trout didn't survive, but back in the um, early part of the century, the fishery people found brook trout in the Yellowstone. There's some indication of hybridization, but they found some arid streams. They don't even tell you where they are. <laughs> you, you, you don't even mention where they are. What was the culture of the local fishermen, maybe the indigenous tourists in the 70s and 80s, were they push as hard to get made trout in Yellowstone? Was I, I'll be honest, I've been out there, you know, like I said, in 75. I've never heard the word lake trout except to go to you know, Lewis and Harper. And I'm back then, if I had hiked to a mountain, you'd walk me driving to a No, I, I don't know the background to it. And, and again, when I, you, we used to, back when you saw those numbers, going, when it was 45,000 going up the stream, and you could go on to Yellowstone Lake and uh, at that time, and you would catch a cutthroat on the fly every other day. And one of the things they stopped, because I used to fish with a fly and a dropper, and many times it takes two at once. And they outlawed the, the dropper, the second fly, because you were injuring too many trout. You know, it might catch 100 a day. You know, it was crazy. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm a wildlife major, not a fisheries guy. Good, I'm not a so, This is, um, so this isn't something that I've heard of, and I was wondering if you think that that's a common thing um, is this a well-known issue, or is this something that a lot of people don't know about? And 
if it isn't, um, you know, with more education and stuff, it would be more funded for research. Yeah, well, I mean, the president Congress is cutting back everything that's related to the environment. He's not getting all funding, but no, no one knows about it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Within Yellowstone, um, you know, it's such a, uh, an unpopular place. People come in, they go to the campgrounds and go fishing. They, they don't know what's happening. The only people who know what's happening are the fishermen who go to Yellowstone. Right? Um, but yes, it's basically an unknown problem except for the fishermen. And there's one other thing I want to mention, because this is my hope. This is uh, next year when I go out. Because the other thing that's fascinating about Yellowstone Lake, that picture I showed you in the beginning, you saw the lake. It's, it's sitting in a caldera from an old a volcano collapse. And as you know, Yellowstone's known for its mud flats and its you know, old faithful. So there's lots of hot springs. And I never thought about this, but while I was out on the boat with Phil, he does something else. Several years ago, a scientist came up with an idea and said, you know, out there in the Pacific Trench, the Atlantic Trench, you can go out and you put these deep divers down and you find these thermal vents coming out and you find exotic worms and clams and shrimp, you know, that they've never seen before. And we know that there are vents in Yellowstone Lake because the can be protected by the temperature. So they actually went to Woods Hole and got out in the deep diving vessel and Phil put it on the back of the boat and he drove around the lake and yes, they did. They discovered thermal vents with the exotic concentration of worm, clam, freshwater um, crustaceans never seen before. And so they started to analyze that and show me some of the videos from Alvin and I'm begging him to let me get back on the boat in two years so we can go look at the vents what's down there, because it's an active research uh, thing from um, Montana State University is researching what's down there. And these were just discovered just a couple of years ago. So it's a fascinating um, area of the world. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I appreciate it.